Hello and welcome to the second video of the machine learning course. In this course, we'll be in this video, we'll be talking about logistic regression, mainly binary classification using logistic regression. Let's understand what binary classification is. So binary classification is when you have some data and you try to classify it into two groups. That's why it's called binary classification. Over here, numbers are, is our x and 0 and 1 can be our y. So how do we do this? And let's look at some data. Here's some classification data where we have the price and quality test score of a t-shirt and we try to find out if it's a top seller or not a top seller. So how do we do this? Well, what we can do is try to use a linear regression model. So by using a linear regression model, our data will look something like this. So we have a straight line and then a straight line for our graph. And then these are the zeros, so there'll be some data points here and then some data points over here. And then when we try and create the best fit line, there's a problem. Why? Let's look. So probability always has to be less than or equal to one. But linear regression deals with continuous values. That means the probability, if you're trying to predict the probability of it being a positive value like one, then it can be greater than one. Let's say it can be five, right? For some x, the linear regression will predict 5. So for some x, let's say for x equals 3, it will predict 5. But 5 can never be the probability of uh, something being 1. So what can we do and what's the solution to this? So the solution is using logistic regression, which is just linear regression plus a sigmoid function. So now let's talk a little about our sigmoid function. Here's the sigmoid function. What it does is we take, give it an x, x value and it does 1 by 1 plus e to the minus x. e is approximately equal to 2.7. So what we'll do is raise it to the power minus x. Let's, let's see how it works. Also, you can see from the graph that all the values of x will always be between 1 and 0. So 0 is 0 0.5 and the more negative you go, the closer to 0 you get. And the more positive you get or the more larger you get, the closer to 1 you get. Let's see how this works. So for now, to make it simple, what I'm going to do is take e as 2. So that so we are going to take e as 2 for this example. But e is approximately equal to 2.7. So what we're going to do is according to the formula, let's say we have x equals 2. So what we'll have is 1 divided by 1 plus 2 raised to the power minus 2. Let's see what that gives us. It gives us 0 0.8. So according to our function, 0 0.8, which is very close to 1, that means 2 is again a high probability. Now let's see one more. Let's say, let's clear this, we have 0. So let's do 1 divided by 1 plus 2 raised to the power 0. Negative 0 and positive 0 are the same thing. And we're going to get 0 0.5. So 0 is the midpoint on the graph. And it will always be equal to 0 0.5. Let's take a look at minus 2. So let's see 1 divided, uh, 1 divided by 1 plus 2 raised to the power 2. Because minus minus gets a plus. And you're going to get 0 0.2, which is closer to 0. So as you can see, it's, it's taking the smaller numbers closer to 0 and the higher numbers closer to 1. But it never really goes above 1 or below 0. How does it do this? Let's see. Let's say x is equal to 2. So negative 2, anything raised to the power negative 2 will be a really small number. Right? And when you add one, when you add 1 to a small number and you divide 1 by that small number, you're going to get something really close to 1, right? So you're going to get something really close to 1. That's why when we took negative 2, so when x was equal to 2, that's why we got something like 0 0.8 when e was equal to 2. But now let's say we have something that is, let's say, 2, just negative 2. So it becomes positive 2 and then it will become a high number because e to the positive power will be a higher number. So let's say e is 2. 2 to the power 2 is 4. 1 plus 4 is 5. 
So what you're going to get is 1 by 5, which is a lower number like 0.2. This is why this is how the function works. And basically what we do is it takes value from the linear regression uh, function and converts it into the probabilities of being a positive class, which is one. This is the cost function for uh, logistic regression. We can't use the mean squared error function or the linear regression cost because as you know, for gradient descent to work, we need this cost function. And what this cost function looks like, it looks like this, where it has one global minimum. But when we use the same cost function with logistic regression, it looks something like this. So it's going to take gradient descent a long time. So gradient descent will get stuck here, then it gets stuck here, then it gets stuck here. So there are too many local minimums. That's why we get this function for the cost. We're going to look at how it works right now. And also some, if you Google this, it's going to be called logistic loss or the binary cross entropy loss. But if you, when you look at the formula, what will, what you'll see is that this and this is positive. And what you have is the negative one by two M to take the average. So the negative actually goes here, but you need to take the average. So um, that's why the negative sign goes there and these two become positive. So now we're going to see why this formula works. Let's say, so uh, let's just look at the notation. So y i just is our target label. So our target label, let's say is one, right? And now what this will become is negative one. So it just becomes a negative log of the predicted. So negative log of y hat minus what one minus predict uh, the actual label. 1 minus 1 will just give 0, 0 times this log, so this will just cancel out, right? And what we have remaining is just the log of y hat. So now let's just see how this function works. We have the negative log of a value, right? So let's see if, let's say if y hat is a high number. So let's see if we've predicted 0.8 or 80% chance that the thing is 1, right? And then we take the negative log of that. So we actually just take the negative log. So we just take the negative log of 0.8. As you can see, we get, a real, we get a low value, right? And now let's say the, so the target table is one, but we have something like this. As you can see, it's a really high value. So that's how the, that's how um, the, the cost function works. And when it's zero, this thing goes away. And this becomes log one minus y hat. Why did why is it one minus y hat? It's it's negative log one minus y hat because we are trying to find the probability of something being one, right? And yeah, we know that f w x i will try and predict the probability of it being zero because it target level zero. So what to make it the to get the probability of it being one, we just need to subtract it from one to get the probability of it being one. Now let's just talk about convergence. Here is a plot of the cost function J compared to the number of iterations. As you can see, after about 250 iterations, it starts becoming stable. What in machine learning, this is called converging or convergence. And now we know that the machine learning model has learned. So now we don't need to run it for more iterations. So we can use converging to check if our learning rate is a correct value or if we have run it for a correct number of iterations. We're going to look at it in the code that we're going to write soon. Let's also talk about normalization. So when one feature is a lot larger than the other feature, let's say price of some object is in, let's say thousands of dollars. But the rating, let's say a rating is in from zero to five, let's say two. There's a problem because price is a much higher value than the rating. How do we fix this? And why is this a problem? So as you can see, a small change in the weight. So let's, according to linear regression, we'll have something like weight one times uh, the price, weight two 
times the rating like that what will happen is a small change in w1 will result in a large change to the model but a small change in w2 won't result in such a large change to the model because this is such a slow value but this is a high value and that's why what we need to understand is that one feature will have a lot of dominance in the model and the other features won't count. So what we are going to try and do is normalize the features into the same range. So there's two ways you can do this. This is called the uh, min-max normalization and this is called z-score normalization. What we are going to do is do z-score normalization but you can use both. What this does is it creates the value, it sets the values in a particular range. So let's say it sets the values in the range of 0 to 1. So now all the values are in the range of 0 to 1. There won't be, a, so the model, so the some, one feature won't get dominant in the model and the other features won't get less dominant. They'll all be at the same, uh, they'll all have the same importance in the model. That, uh, so that's it for the slides. Now let's do, write the code. So the code for this will be on GitHub. I will keep the put the link in the description. And for this, it's a top seller predictor. So this is my Google Colab and I have connected my uh, runtime. I'm going to start by running these cells and we'll talk about the code. So the fir first cell imports math and random. It also imports NumPy and matplotlib for the plotting. Next, we're using uh, a function to generate some sales data and num rows. Why we are doing this is because I wanted to create some new data for uh, this tutorial. What we are doing is taking units sold and putting it in between 1 to 1000. So the unit sold can be between 1 to 1000. Average rating is between 3 and 5. And what we are doing is we are checking if it's a top seller by seeing if units sold are greater than 500 and the average rating is greater than 4. And then labels are just is top seller dot as type int. So basically when it's true, it's going to be one. And when it's false, it's going to be zero. Then we're just stacking this, uh, to creating two columns and returning that. Let's run this function. What we're going to do is create 200 rows of data and call this X chain, Y chain, X, where X chain is the features and Y chain are the labels. Let's see the shape of both. If we take a look at the X chain dot shape, what we see is 202 because the two features are the rating and the unit sold and there are 200 rows and if we see Y chain, we, see, we can see that it's just 200. So now what we're going to see, what we're doing is just using this for plotting. Let's just plot this. And now you can see the plot. So these are the red values which are not soft sellers and these top values where the unit sold are high and the rating is high, it's top sellers. You can use this in real life. Let's say I'm a shopkeeper and I want to know if some product will be a top seller. I can just put the rating and the units sold already into a model and see if it will be a top seller. Now, there's one problem, right? As you can see, units sold can be between 0 to 1000, but the rating can just be between 3 and 5. So we need to normalize our data. So we're going to use z-score normalization to do this. If you look at the formula, it's x minus mean divided by the standard deviation. So we try, we find the mean by doing x chain dot mean. And if you take the standard deviation by doing x chain dot std, then we just set it to be minus mean divided by std. Let's run that. Now that that's done, we have just normalized the data. Now let's see x chain. As you can see, everything is just in decimals uh, and it can be negative and positive. So now we have normalized that. So now we need the sigmoid function. If we take see the sigmoid function again, the formula is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the negative x. So over here, we're just taking the sigmoid z and we're doing return 1 divided by 1 plus np dot x minus z. np dot x minus z, what it does is just sends just raises e to some power and the power is what you specify here which is minus z because we need the negative x and this over here z is the value so it's just going to be negative z 
Now the dash line, we're going to write the cost function. If we see the cost function, this is the cost function where we have m and n as the x dot shape and the cost is zero. What we're doing is for i in range of m for every row, what we're doing is we're taking z, which is the probability, which is not the probability, but just the linear regression model. Then we are running it through the sigmoid function to get the probability. Then what we're doing is just adding negative y i times np dot log. So we're just taking the log of fwb minus one minus y i times the np dot log of the probability of it being zero, then dividing it by m and returning the cost. Over here, I didn't divide it by negative m. I just put the negative sign here and here instead of dividing it by negative m. Now let's just run the compute gradient. It's the same uh, exact function as we had in our linear regression video. You can see the last video to find out more about linear regression and these fu uh, functions. Gradient descent is again the same thing. So we're just going to run that. Now what, we, what we've done is just taking random.seed1. This is just so that uh, when you run this code again, you will get the same uh, random values as I'm getting. And what we're doing is we're setting two random, so two, because there's two features, right? The unit sold and the rating. And we're reshaping it to negative one comma one. We just put all, that, all of them into columns instead of rows, right? And the initial B is just negative eight and some gradient descent settings are just we are putting the running uh, this for 10,000 iterations with the alpha or the learning rate being 0 0.1. So I did this after a, after a lot of experimentation. I'm going to see, I'm going to show you how we can do it. So I'm going to run this. This will take some time since we are running for 10,000 iterations and okay. So it took about one minute to run. 1 minute 18 seconds. Now we're going to just plot it. What we are plotting is, uh, wait, so I forgot to write a semi so semicolon. Let's run this again. So now we have seen, uh, this is just plotting cost versus, cost versus iteration. That's why we stored it in J history, right? What this is, is uh, this, these are the just first 100 iterations and these are the rest of the 100 iterations. So uh, yeah, these are after the 100 iterations. Why we do this is because for the first few iterations, the cost declines steeply. As you can see, it is declining. For the next few iterations, it goes at a more stable rate. As you can see, the model has converged in a few iterations. We didn't really need 10,000 iterations. It took uh, some time to converge. So this is how I found out the exact values that I need for alpha and iterations. In the beginning, uh, the alpha was 0 0.01 and this was only 1000. Then I ran this and the graph was wrong. So I kept changing it until I ran it on 10,000 iterations and 0 0.1 as my alpha. So now as you can see, the model has converged. Let's run the predict function. What this does is it takes a X and a WB then what it does is it creates some zeros. So basically the number of rows, then for everything, we just find the linear regression, run it through the sigmoid function for the probability, and then just check and then say if it's one, if it's greater than 0 0.5, else it will be zero and then return uh, the P. Now let's predict it all on X train WB and let's find our train accuracy. It's 92%. So our train accuracy is 92%, which means that we can predict if it will be a top seller or not a top seller with 92% accuracy. Let's test this out. So we have some values which are 900, which is the unit sold and 4.3, which is the rating. Next, we remember that we need to normalize these values because our weights and biases are trained on the normalized values. So that's why we are normalizing it using the mean and the SDD that we had stored before. Then we are just predicting and if it's one, it's a top seller, else it's not a top seller. Let's run this. As you can see, it's a top seller. Let's see if we had sold about 100 units. And the rating is 